There we go. Yeah, so we farm 6,200 hectares in the northern wheat belt of Western Australia, in a little place called Minganew, on a combination of owned and leased land. Uh, we're mixed, mixed crop and livestock farmers, uh, cropping wheat, lupins and canola in rotation, as well as a self-replacing merino flock of 1,500 ewes. We're a family business, so I fa farm in partnership with my wife, Fiona, my parents, my brother, Tim, and his partner. Um, and our business, probably for the last six to eight years, have had a real focus on mum and dad's transition into retirement. That's included building a house on the coast, adding to a super fund. And it's been a big success, but it's, um, it's, it's required some significant capital. And we're also a, a, an example of a business where two brothers have come home to the farm. Um, we've both started, recently started our own families in the last 12 months. So we've had to have one eye on the future and um, succession and, and more and more is getting asked of our, biz of, of our business. We managed to expand through this time through um, a small land acquisition but also a series of short term leases but they have been highlighted by a, a lack of security and as I stand here today all, all the country that we lease is currently on the market. So my Arfield topic. Uh, expansion is a fact of life. If you want enough hand land onto the next generation, you need enough land to be viable. So that was a comment by Michael Screws, the US, Deputy US Secretary of Agriculture in Washington. It was just a quote that, that really resonated with me. So we farm in a, in a place where we're, we've had some pretty significant climatic variability recently, uh, whether it be drought, uh, heat stress, frost, which has impacted on yields and obviously our performance. And I've tried to highlight that, um, just the volatility in the performance of our business. We've had some pretty wild fluctuations in commodity prices, which we've tried our best to manage. And we've also got rising costs, and that's probably best demonstrated with what um, machinery is doing at the moment. It's my view that the most efficient businesses are best placed to absorb these pressures. And, and broadacre grain businesses should have a focus on cost of production and, and realise that expansion, if, if managed well, can play a key role uh, in that production efficiency through improved economies of scale. And our business has seen the examples of, of that, you know, it was six years ago with our three labour units and one set of plant, we were cropping 3,000 hectares and, um, you know, now we're cropping well over five and, the, and we've seen that. Um, with our improved performance. The status quo to expansion at the moment is generally you know, bank finance and borrowing money, usually buying the farm next door. Um, but I see that, bet, that debt, you are restricted by your peak borrowing capacity um, and, you, and you are vulnerable to a, to a run of poor seasons. So it is a, it is a barrier absolutely to expansion and, and most certainly to new entrants to the industry. Um, you know, and if we're honest, if you're not the beneficiary of inheritance, it's a very difficult industry to get into. So what are the options? Um, who is your best business partner? Um, all the family farms I know, including ourselves, have a, have a bank as a major equity partner, and that's been a trusted and, and long-standing relationship. We all understand our obligations and commitments under that arrangement, and we, and we farm in a time of relatively low interest rates. So I was really conscious of comparing everything I looked at back to um, borrowing money off the bank. So can you bring in fresh capital with an investor or are there possibilities to bring in another farmer and achieve your, uh, your expansion goals that way? So there is significant interest in, in investing in farmland. Um, just pure demand and supply with our growing population, there's a growing demand for food. There's economy growth happening in emerging markets, that's happening right on our doorstep, particularly here in, in Darwin. And I think since the GFC, um, farmland actually performed reasonably well during that time and people have, investors have realised that, you know, farmland sits there as a pretty important part of it and of a, a diversified investment portfolio. So the question I had was can, can family farms leverage their expansion plans off this interest in farmland of others? So in particular, what I studied, I, I, want, I looked at institutional investment and what was happening in that space. I wanted to look at private equity and the idea of, uh, bring, you know, harnessing fresh capital, um, or, or the idea of, of, of collaborating between like-minded farmers. 
It's an institutional investment. It was a, um, it was a consultant uh, back in Western Australia who recently said that you know we're a family farm dominated area with the institutions only taking up 5% of the marketplace at the moment, but by 2050 he expected that to be greater than 25%. So it's definitely a changing marketplace. And I think as that baby boomer generation looks to retire and in, and in the absence of a successor, there's going to be, and we're seeing it at the moment, but quite a lot of tightly held properties coming onto the market. And um, so there's, there's a world of opportunity out there. It's just finding the right model. But these, what's important about the institutional investment is, is how they plan on managing their assets. And um, the, three, the three models that I identified was the own lease model, which in Western Australia is, is you know, we, we, we call the, um, the Westchester model. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they'll, they'll buy the asset, lease it out to a, a farmer tenant um, who, who, who farms it and take on, takes on all the risk. They're generally looking for a three, four, five percent return on the value of the land. They've got pretty long-term uh, investment cycles and hope to make a capital gain. The second one, uh, the own managed model, so an example of that would be Assad, where they would um, employ a farm manager and, and farm it and take on risk as a farmer would. There's not a huge amount of opportunity for the family farm in that space other than perhaps some, some contracting opportunities. And the third one and where I probably see the most potential is the hybrid lease, which is more a partnership between a high performing family farm and, a, and an institutional investor. And in that situation there would be a base type payment uh, and, on, and on top of that the landowner would be entitled to an incentive payment on top of that. So that could be based on any parameter. It could be um, rainfall, gross margin or yield. So it is a bit more of a share farming type arrangement and, and, and sharing the risk. And the reason I see the, the, the potential in that, and, and, and I saw it overseas, but as land values increase to a point where they move beyond what the land can actually produce, um, you know, if they're still chasing three, four, five percent, the leases can get, can get really expensive. So this is a good way of, um, of, of sharing the risk. Um, and I saw some great examples of that. Uh, in, in Saskatchewan, I caught up with Cantera Capital Corp, uh, and they're the agricultural arm of the, the Canadian Pension Fund. They're buying land through Saskatchewan and Alberta, and I, I met the acquisitions manager who told me that 80% of their transactions were actually um, family farmers uh, selling their farms and then leasing them back. And I found that really interesting, and I asked the guy, you know, what, what was motivating them, and he said, um, you know, it's, it's just an opportunity to realise the value of your land, but, it, you know, they were quite often using it to transition into retirement, but also others would, you know, look to retire debt or, or um, fund other land acquisitions or, or um, investment on their farms. So, so, yeah, it is happening. But the big, um, the key consideration that I had was if you were a family farmer, then how do you attract a partner? And um, it, it, it is very competitive, that's what um, need to understand and it, it might require a shift from the way the family farm is operating at the moment and um, become more investor ready and I'll, I'll touch on that in my recommendations. Also looked at um, private equity and, and Rabobank looked after me in, uh, in the Netherlands for a few days and told me about their trial prog pro program called Rabo & Co which was basically connecting private bankers of Rabo Bank and, and agricultural projects. And um, it, you had to qualify, you had to have over a million dollars uh, cash in the bank. And um, they said there was just, just huge interest from, from these bankers and agricultural projects, but, but a real lack of projects. And the reason was that they were chasing a 7% a return um, on the money. And at the end of the day, most farmers could actually secure um, you know, finance for, for less than that. But Rabo, you know, it is something that they were going to keep an eye on moving forward and particularly with issues to do with solvency and as, as banks' lending criteria um, tightens, um, it may become more, more, more of an alternative. And, and the Rabo Bank, um, my contact there actually made the comment that moving forward, you know, perhaps Rabo Bank would be more of a financial organiser, so connecting investors and farmers rather than, rather than pure lenders themselves. Um, I looked at crowdfunding also and, um, uh, you know, again, as long as a, a, a 
the farm has promoted itself and branded itself well. They're, they're, they're just what you know on the right platform. There just wasn't any, any lack of interest from from investors. Um, but again, the rate of return was was too high. Um, and and where I did see it working was probably more like non-monetary -mon arrangements. So um, I, I met a Dutch farmer who had put a, a hiking path uh, through her farm, and it was the local village had um, had chipped in, and and it, but they they were happy just having access to the path rather than rather than expecting any any money back. So in terms of actually funding a, an acquisition through crowdfunding at the moment, or, or or Rabo and Co, for example, I, I, I just don't think the numbers line up. I also looked at um, collaboration, which, um, which is, is like-minded farmers joining together to, to create efficiencies. And um, I saw great potential here, but it could be the sharing of uh, machinery, could be the, mach um, the sharing of staff, or, um, or, e or even land assets. And, a great example um, in Palmerston North in New Zealand was Morrison Farming, who they were farming um, on the flats. Their land had just gone through the roof and land va in, in value with, with, the, um, with the dairy boom. And it was two brothers and a cousin all working uh, side by side. And it, that actually got to the point where they were considering uh, leaving the industry. Um, but they got together uh, one, once a month for, for 12 months and just discussed joining forces and what, what the perfect business would look like and, you know, how efficient it would be. So they ended up, um, uh, yeah, joining up and all, all the, they all became directors on the board, so shifted to a more, um, more corporate type arrangement or advisory board rather than a family management structure. And uh, yeah, they said that the absolute key was that good governance, communication, and, and really important to have a, a clearly defined exit strategy. And, and what was interesting that the initial motivation was absolutely financial, and, and, and they'd had a great result. They'd actually lowered their cost of production. And, and in addition to that, they'd actually uh, managed to expand their business. They just bought some country, uh, you know, some uh, work country up in the hills. Um, but in, on top of that, they just, you know, farmers being able to work in a team and share in the successes and the lows, and you know, we all know that can happen in farming. You know, farmers are very independent, but they enjoyed working as part of a team. And also, just having more staff and more people around, they said their work-life balance was much improved and they weren't, um, you know, missing out on the important things in life like many um, family farmers can. So Lone Star Family Farms, um, they're down in the Texan panhandle and they're just a fantastic example of a family farm which has used a variety of these techniques I'm talking about to grow their business. Um, they're now farming 50,000 irrigated acres, growing a variety of crops. Um, they've got six specialist managers um, overseeing 40 staff. Um, this is Justin Crownover. Um, and what's sort of particularly Amazing about this business, they've achieved this incredible growth, um, even enduring some really significant hard hardships. And Justin lost his brother and his dad um, in separate accidents um, over the, over the past few years. But the way they've expanded, um, initially in 2009, again it was a collaborative arrangement between Justin, his brother, and a cousin. And they, so in 2009, they were farming 12,000 acres, and. Um, through a variety of techniques, including leasing, uh, vendor term deals, they'd vertically integrated into irrigation shops in town. They'd partnered partnered with institutional investors. They'd sold a, a, a parcel of land to the Hancock Agricultural Group, and then they were leasing it back, which had freed up money to make other investments and build the, inf the on on farm infrastructure that you can see there. And again, Justin made the comment that those hardships and the rapid growth had been made possible by good governance. And um, I, I thought just a great example of a business that had grown really quickly, but, but also sustainably. Um, I also caught up with Colin Huddon, who's a 2015 Canadian scholar uh, in, just outside of Winnipeg in, in Manitoba. And he, he's running a farm management company and to me, they were a bit of an answer for people looking to connect investors and farmers. Um, they basically find, acquire and manage agricultural properties on behalf of investors. And then depending on the investor's um, objectives, he, he will work to connect them with family farmers looking to expand. 
Um, Colin made the comment to me that the best partners and, and the easiest to work with were, were just absolutely retiring farmers. He said that, you know, he spent a lot of time trying to educate pension fund managers and these kind of guys, but retiring farmers, you know, they understand our industry and its challenges. Um, so the challenge is really trying to convince these guys to, to, to not sell their assets and um, hang on to them. And, um, and, and in addition to that, they've just got some really significant IP that, you know, it'd, it'd be great to hand on to a, a young guy looking to expand or, or, or a new entrant to the industry. So my recommendations, um, I believe you need a very good reason to step away from the bank. Um, I think that using bank finance to buy land is still an ideal way to grow your business, but maybe in combination with some of these other strategies I'm talking about, particularly with where interest rates are at the moment. And in terms of trying to attract a partner, you need to understand that it is very, you know, it's very competitive, not only amongst farmers, but also these guys have all sorts of different things they can invest their money in. Um, so, you know, it may require a shift from, our, from a family structure to one which is a bit more investor ready. So rather than worry about where your partner is or the money is coming from at the moment, maybe, you know, spend some time preparing your business. And, and that could include some really comprehensive business plans and budgets, you know, they want to see that your business is benchmarked. Um, they want to see good decision making, so, you know, corporate governance and there might need to be an increase in some, uh, some financial reporting. Consider branding your business, whether it be websites or brochures and at the end of the day when they're looking at you as a partner or a tenant, um, they see you as a potential risk, so anything you can do to reduce, reduce your risk profile, so whether that be um, HR policies, uh, OCH health and safety, environmental policies, public liability insurance um, is, a, is a step in the right direction. And in terms of collaboration and joint ventures, um, absolutely the key is good governance and communication. So again, whether that means a shift to an advisory board, you know, if from a family management structure to a more corporate one, then that, that might help. And, and again, and this was a common... Uh, comment from for everyone. It's very important to have a clear exit strategy. And, and again, I think that farm management companies can play a really key role in, uh, in connecting farmers and investors. And um, you know, hopefully we see some more of them in the future. So yeah, I just need to say a big thank you, particularly to, to my wife, Fiona, um, leaving her at home, and, and, and also my family for uh, keeping the wheels turning while I was away. A uh, big thank you to, to GRDC, uh, not only for their support of me, but also uh, you know their continued support of Nuffield. And again, to, to Nuffield, um, I need to say thanks just for a phenomenal experience um, and the wider network. Um, it's just just yeah, just been brilliant. And and in particular, thank my uh, my mates from the Brazil GFP, which which has just been an absolute highlight. Thanks very much. <laughs> Fantastic, James, and a great presentation.